Welcome to the Bigfoot Society. In this episode, we are releasing three classic interviews from the archives, Maryland to Tennessee to British Columbia. If you've experienced something similar or have more information regarding Bigfoot or other cryptids in the same areas, please reach out to me immediately after this episode. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, please contact me directly at BigfootSociety at gmail.com and make sure you also check out BigfootSocietyPodcast.com where you can become a member and get extra episodes weekly. Hey, Bigfoot Society, I've got Mark on the phone. Uh, he's going to tell us about what he has experienced out in his neck of the woods. How's it going, Mark? Back to bed. You know, the usual, lots of kids in the house and bugs flying around, but well, I'm to work. But I mean, anyways, as for the stuff I've experienced, I've been a, I've been a, I mean, believe it ever since the early 70s when people were still talking about Patty at the drop of a hat. And I was running through with some buddies in the woods back in uh, outside of Traverse City, Michigan. I thought for sure I saw these um, good sized prints, but everybody blew them off a bear. I didn't think they looked like bear tracks, but I was probably 11. So what did I know back then? Well, that's years and years later. 2019, I bring the family down here to East Tennessee. Everybody has this misconception, they still see it all the time, that to have interactions. I was in uniform for a very long time. I've been in some interesting places. I know when people are you know, watching me or when I'm being observed. So we're on the, on the front yard in this house. I'm, we're in, it's been empty for a couple of years. And my grandkids are out ripping it down in the front yard. Turn around talking to my wife and daughter sitting on the porch on the front porch and I just caught something out of my corner of my eye. I turned to look at the wood line, which is probably 100, 125 meters away. No, no, it was a this huge black shape. I was too far to see his face or anything. After going out there later, I figured he was probably eight, nine feet tall anyway. Shoulders were probably four and a half, five foot wide. I mean, this guy was big. I hope you don't mind the language, but it will. Of course, I go, the wife doesn't know what I'm looking at. I turn to look at him and I say, what the F is that? And he must have, even at that distance, he must have known that I had seen him. As he turned to his left, my right. And as I sped off into the thicker underbrush, I could see he had long hair on his on his back because I could actually see it blow out behind him. Of course, I'm like, what the? Of course, the wife thought it. They always thought I'm a little nuts from my old job, and she didn't quite know what to, whether to believe me or not. But I went out there the next day, and I didn't, I didn't want to go out there right afterwards. <laughs> but uh, I went out there the next day, and you could see on the outside of the electric fence, because this is where our horse pasture, where something that beat a, a heavily used trail down to that spot. And I could see Bert when he... When he took off, I could see broken branches and stuff. That uh, apparently he, you know, plowed through on his way away from here. So that let me know that, okay, we're not alone around here. Talked to a couple of the neighbors and whatnot. And one guy in his family has been here for generations. According to what he said, like half Cherokee. So he's, he knows a lot of the stories around here. Just like some places, everybody thinks they're just stories. Well, some people around here, they just treat them as the folks that live out in the woods. I've always done research this time. You know, these guys do quite a bit. Kicked it up even hotter after that, especially for the locals and whatnot, because I want to know what I'm seeing around here. And, but that was the first time we got an above ground pool that we're putting up all back. This was some months later. I get that itch again. I'm looking out through the woods. And this guy, he's 
he was red hair, so it wasn't the same one. And he looked like he was smaller. But they was doing that peeking from behind the tree thing. I didn't get antsy or anything this time. I just treated him like he was a neighbor. Hey, how you doing? I see you back there. And it actually came out from about halfway behind the tree and stood there. And watched us as we tried to put the pool together and whatnot. These guys must be, they're curious about what we do too. All these people tramping through the woods looking for them. They're curious about us as well. But a couple months after that, I'll take care of I have a girl with special needs. She's fed through a G-tube. And, and so I'm sitting up for noon feeding. And this time I'm just looking out the back window. Back in the same general area, I saw the red-haired guy. And at first I thought, it because we just had a big storm come through here not too long before, right? I'm thinking, okay, that's just a tree stump, right? And what everybody says, I'll put it, what do call them, stump squatches? At first, I'm thinking, yeah, it's just a big old tree stump. I got hit by lightning because it was you know, cut off. And then it starts swaying back and forth. I'm like, we got foster kids, so I take the two boys, bring them in there. Because the boys are 16 or 13 then. And I said, look right out there, and what do you see? He says, what? I said, look at that. It looks like a tree standing there. And then they go, both of them are like, holy crap, it's moving. And yep, they're watching us again. So that was three. And just recently, just a couple months ago, this encounter is exciting, but the horses were fine. I've got a bunch of big dogs, and they were going just crazy out back. Now, around here, this area has a, uh, not just those guys in the woods, like a lot of other areas, some of the local folks are into, shall we say, homemade pharmaceuticals. So I wanted to make sure everything was good out there. I gave Bobby, my oldest foster boy, he, the spotlight. I grabbed my 45. And we went out there to take a look. And we got back there, and the, the horses are fine. The neighbor back to the woods is close. All I can see is yard lights. And of course, there's this huge shadow sitting there. And by now, um, I don't act scared of these guys that, that much anymore. So I act like I'm just holding a conversation. Hey, how you doing, big guy? Just don't make sure things are okay, this kind of thing. And then we notice, because I see his eye shine, so I know he's there anyways. And then he's got this huge shadow from the light. And we see something, just movement to our right. There's two more sets of eye shine at two different heights. I think, okay. And then we have a crew to our left, and from where we were standing, that was by. 75 meters down the hill. In between these things, I've got pictures of tracks in my uh, pasture, and I know a few of the trees on my there where they've been absorbing the house. As you can see, where the they've uh, beaten down spots by the base of the tree, that kind of thing. And I know they come up out of that freaking that creek bed because when it's dry, it goes all the way up the mountain, and it's heavily wooded on both sides. So, uh, you know, an elephant could walk down that thing without being seen. So I've got three sets of eyes shining around us already. And I hear something down in the creek. Rocks, you know, getting knocked over. But the Bobby said, you hear that? And he says, oh. And then he's looking pretty scared. And so I turn around. I look back towards him. You know, man, that's what I call him is the big guy. So tell you what. We're going to go back in the house. You guys have a good night. And maybe a lot of people say this stuff, but says, tell you, what, you keep keeping the black bears and the coyotes stuff out of my pasture, I'll bring you something tomorrow. So I control the pistol with my left hand and raise my arm up with a wave hello. And he did it back. Made me feel pretty good that I've, you know, that. This guy actually, and I could be wrong. I can go out in the woods behind the house again next time. He could appear and 
snap me in half. Obviously, you can do that being that big. But he acknowledged my presence, and I thought that was a good sign. So the next day, I braided the, this was before Halloween last year, I raided the kids' caramel apples, took two of them back there, I actually climbed up into a tree a little bit, back where I had, first where I'd seen them, and I shoved them down in some branches, so you couldn't, you had to pick them up and move them to take them. And I didn't, because it was the, the middle of the afternoon when I placed them, I just looked around and said, there you go, dude. Hope you enjoy. Went back to the house, minding my own business, and the following day, went back out there, both those apples were gone. No sticks, no chewing on cores, they were just gone. I think I might have spoiled them, though. But I've tried to give him regular apples after that. He hasn't touched them. I laid a candy bar out there in the same tree. That was gone. I did the uh, Snickers. I took it out of the pack and laid it up in the tree and shoved it on the branches again so you had to work to get at it. And that was gone, too. But so far, I think I, I almost made him upset last year because he went around and trimmed the brush around the horse fence and got the electric fence working again. I'm just the way I'm thinking. I think I might have shocked him a little bit once I got it going again. Because a couple of days afterwards, if listeners and you probably know about that, you've seen the stories about the trees shoved upside down in the ground. I'll buy where I made my first sighting, I guess. It was about a 15, 20 foot tall log. log. So I guess it was a part of a tree that had broken off and been there. But it was shoved eight inches in rocky, mountainous Tennessee ground. And then the wider part was balanced up in the crookers and branches way up high. I'm like, I had some couple of buddies come over and we took it down. And I was afraid it was going to fall on the fence and knock it down the next wind that comes through. And of course, he's blowing it off. Ah, it just didn't. Where it fell off, well, I, I could see where it snapped off. I'm like, yeah. trying to explain to him, like, dude. So that branch snapped off, flew 25, 30 freaking feet through the air, and landed perfectly in the ground and managed to shove itself in this ground and balance up there. But I just said, whatever you say, man. So we pulled it out and left it laying there. The one thing I really found strange about all oh, that after doing that, so I figured I'd pick him off and might have surprised him some of that you know, 6,000 volts. A couple weeks later, something picked up the log and it was outside the fence. Why he cleaned that up, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know how to, these guys think. You guys in East Tennessee, I'm assuming you know who Scott Carpenter is. I watch all his stuff. I just try to stay on good terms with the folks in the woods. So I walk the wood line and just try to talk and stay on good terms with them and say, look, out there is your area, and here's my area. As long as we keep it that way, we, we are good to go. Besides so tracks through the, my pasture, I've got, I'm assuming it was him, because I've got a picture of a one clear out of a trail, the damn thing is a left foot, perfectly clear toes, 20 inches long, and it's got to be eight inches wide. And the stride was long enough for I'm not a very big guy, but I had to jump from track to track. There's lots of stories of uh, you know, one showing signs of aggression. I talked to one guy that's not too far from me. Apparently, up in, up there in the mountains, he's had the classic rocks and stuff like that thrown at him. <laughs> we go up there, that we're here, we are in their, their yard, their living room. Apparently, he didn't like you being there. 
want to talk about all this is I haven't gone on trail walking in quite a while now. I just try to show some respect for these guys. Mm -hmm. so pretty much my experience with them is I track different size prints all the time. Pet. My pasture, everything from I said his, his is 20, almost 20 inches. I thought was a smaller set that was on head all the way back to the pasture. And that one looked like it had broken a toe one time because the big toe on the left foot was pointing in like drastically. Don't like to have anybody on the set there with broken bones. But they've been as close as before I started talking to them on a regular basis. I found a trail that came all the way to the side of the house. But I, I haven't seen anything like that in a long time. So um, I figure maybe my getting on good terms with those folks was a good thing. I do have one vocalization. I'm scaring some coyotes away. I love some security cameras outside. You can hear the coyotes. And this guy growled at him. You don't hear coyotes anymore. <laughs> First thing I figure they must have been arguing over a kill. That's my stuff down here in a nutshell. But I, so I go out to the pasture on a regular basis to see if anybody's been stepping over the fence that coming in. I know they like wild raspberries because I was following that track, the trail from outside back in the pasture. And you can see where it stopped. And you remember to see the raspberries out behind outside of the fence and then I don't really I've told other people I don't care about proof anymore because I'm not worried about proving it when I know they're there because people have asked me when I when it's just this guy stepped back over the fence and apparently ate too many of those raspberries if you get my meaning you let them all drop in my pasture it was quite a bit large pile I got people, why didn't you scoop some up? Because I, I don't care. I don't want people around here, out there going, no. I don't even want not. I'm a firm believer that uh, certain agencies know that they haven't been doing things to them for years. I consider you my neighbor. Why the hell would I want a bunch of idiots running around the woods out here? I've been following you for life. Just going through YouTube one day and I found your channel. I think, oh, well, I follow all the, what I consider Decent ones and some people that don't like me or realize and and VTV and all that. Because people say they have a bad reputation. It's like all they do is put out there what people post, as far as I know. Or like you, you know, Steve Isdall, know how to hunt. Some of these guys I've uh, started reading and following Dave Pilates a lot. I was twenty years infantry and twelve years a military cop. He was a long-time cop on the outside. So, mm -hmm. listen to him speak, it seems like we think along the same wavelengths. It sounds like you're not really scared of having these creatures around your house at all. Well, I know people destroy it, even, even vets, that as soon as they see one, all of a sudden they're, they get this, you know, mm -hmm. You know, the, the deep seated fear. Mm. Is that I, some folks consider me a little different than a lot of folks? Sure. I've been in a lot of been in a lot of bad places myself, been in some bad scrapes that some every once in a while I had to pull myself out. Mm. Germany I had to believe it or not they have wild boars in Germany. Oh, yeah. get about three hundred pounds. I faced one down with a pickaxe one night and <laughs> years and years <laughs> and an exercise and we were we were on an exercise, all we had is blank rounds. And they decided to come down and start go running through our gear and garbage. So I picked up the closest thing I could and get them out of there. And that was that axe. Am I totally brave that I walk out there and do something stupid that one of these guys won't you know, fix my attitude? Well, no, because well, this is just my way of thinking. I figure they're like they are people. A lot larger stronger, mm. and do things a lot different than we do. 
but just like people, some are well, good guys and some are raging a-holes. Whereas me, more about running out, into out there is somebody found a 500-pound black bear sighting not too long ago. They're, they are known to freaking take people out. Dave Grano, about an hour and a half north of me last year, Earl was in a hammock and a black bear pulled out of her hammock. <sighs> and but there's been seems to be more dogman sightings in the same with state lake in recent months. In your area. So um, Carpenter's got two videos that he took. Oh sure, yeah. Usually when I end the hug said, I'm I've got this feeling when I'm being lost. We were out there just checking the fence line just the other day. And it wasn't the same feeling. It was I could tell something was out there they didn't want to do harm. And for change of pace, usually I don't go by the near the woods without some lead based backup, shall we say. Smart. Well, I didn't take any with me that day, so I had two of the boys with me. And I'm like, let's get back to the house now. Then obviously we know that those are known to be violent. Look at the land between the lakes that everybody and the brothers investigating. That guy took out an entire family. Mm. Once I moved down here, there's tales of the cult and creatures and these mountains are full of just unexplained mm. stuff. I kind of come to find out there was a family killed back here in 96, about 10 miles away from my house. And supposedly it was a satanic deal there. Really? This area is known for weird stuff. It's a lot of a lot of things going on in your area, it sounds like, for sure. It sounds like you haven't seen the last of the Bigfoot around your property, I would guess. From what you've said so far, you probably will have more encounters, for sure. I have no problem in the world with that. So I, I try to show him respect. He shows me respect. And we're good. If the ones that's supposed to have the attitude show up, there are some advantages to being a broken up veteran because I do have some tools that might open that. We'll leave that to the imagination. Yeah. Mark, this has been quite the conversation. I'm glad that we were able to connect and uh, you were able to share what you've encountered so far. All right, Bigfoot Society, you've got the privilege of talking to uh, Mr. Hernando from Florida today. We had talked back and forth a little bit on TikTok, I believe it was, and uh, he's got some interesting stories to share about Bigfoot. So, Hernando, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. And beautiful Sunday here in Florida. Very good. So, let's get right down to it. Yeah, I'd like to start from just before my father's passing, just a couple of years ago. I was his caretaker in the last year or so of his life. He'd come down with uh, pancreatic cancer. And he was letting go of a lot of things that he'd experienced in a lifetime. And at the time, he was aware of my interest and my activities here in Mayaka in Florida. And he, he wanted to make sure I didn't give up as easily as I was wanting to. Out here looking for the skunk ape in the Mayaka. State Park and the adjacent area. And as the story goes, one day about two months before he passed away, I was at my wit's end. I, I'd, I'd been out there for almost two years, off and on looking around. I hadn't really seen anything, hadn't heard anything. I'd seen some footage from some associates of mine that are pretty well-known footage on the internet. And I told them, I said, I just feel like I'm wasting my time out there. It's it's a beautiful setting to be in, but it's just a lot of time to be spent out looking for something that you're just not sure exists. And he told me, he said, son, whatever you don't give up, these things are out there. He said, I have no intention on telling anybody about what actually happened to me in the Pokemon Forest. I said, well, what are you, what are you referring to, Dad? He said, you recall in 96, 
you were at work that week. You, you didn't have the opportunity to come out hunting with me that week. It was a Wednesday in 96, the winter of, of 96. And he was hunting in the same spot. Him and I had both hunted for over 10 years. You know, I was in my early teens when he first started taking me out there. And off and on, for, for many years, both he and I would have a conversation after coming out of the woods. Did you hear someone walking through the woods? I, I told him, I said, yeah, oftentimes it, it, I would hear someone walking. It was clearly something on two feet, but we'd never seen anything. That Wednesday that I was unable to accompany him hunting, he was hunting in the same spot we had hunted for roughly 12, 12 years. And he said, it was the day I, I came and saw you that afternoon, and I told you, I refuse to hunt there anymore, and I wouldn't tell you why. He said, I even left my tree climber back there because of what happened. And I said, well, what do you mean by that, Dad? He said, son, these things exist, and they're in a lot more places than people even think. The Eastern Shore is an isolated peninsula. I'd, I'd never heard of anybody even mentioning the word Bigfoot on the eastern shore of Maryland. And he continued to tell me, he said, I was in my tree stand that morning. I'd been up there around 4.30, 5 o'clock. And he said, around 7.30, I heard something coming from behind me. And he had his tree stand facing due west on a very large pine tree that was up on a sand hill. And you could see, as far as the eye could see, without obstruction from some other things, like you would on the ground. He was quite high. I'd say probably about 14 or 15 feet up the tree. And he said, I heard it again. He said, I heard footsteps. And it was what sounded like a very large person. And he said, as the footsteps got closer, he said, to my very left, about 25 or 30 yards. wasn't very far. He said, out of my left eye, I saw what I thought was another hunter, which aggravated me quite a bit because pretty far removed into the forest. We rarely saw any other hunters there at all, uh, at least in that section of the forest. And he said, I was watching out of the corner of my eye. I was about to say something because I thought it was another hunter. He said, I turned my head slightly to the left. And he said, it looked like a man in a ghillie suit, but very tall. He said, it was, it was probably about seven foot tall. He said, as I turned my head further to, to observe it, he said, my tree stand shifted due to the wind. These things can shift in the tree moves around, he said it squeaked. He said when it squeaked, it turned and looked him directly in the eye. And he said whenever it looked him in the, in, in the eye, he realized that it was not a human. And he said that the overwhelming fear of what I was looking at completely locked me up. He said, Son, I've been through two tours in Vietnam, and I've never been so frightened. He said, when it looked him in the eye, he said, this thing had red eyes. And it was completely covered in hair. And this is when I said, Dad, you, you had a gun in your hand. He said, this thing, if I had shot it, would have definitely climbed the tree and beat me to death with it. He said it was so massive and so scary looking. He said it was quite much like something out of a horror film. And he said whenever it, it gave him a gaze and it stared at him for a few moments and it, it just as quickly as it had turned his head to look at him, it shifted back the way it was going and ran directly through a briar patch that was frankly in, in impenetrable by a human being anyhow. 
And he said, whenever I heard, you know, no more trees snapping, no debris being stepped on, I immediately climbed down my tree stand and, and headed the other direction. He said, I, after that, I didn't want anything to do with that property. It was intensely frightening. I think a lot of people have this impression, well, well, if I got a gun and I'm out there and I see one, I'm going to shoot it. And I think there's something primordial in, in a person's brain that stops you from reacting in a logical manner. And that's what he, he definitely experienced that day. And it frightened him so much, he, he never returned to get his, his tree climber and refused to ever hunt there again. It's just an absolutely fascinating story. First, thank you so much for sharing. Did he say anything about if he heard it make any noise at all? Yeah, yes, yes, he did. He said when it shifted its gaze and looked at him, and when it shifted its head back away from him and it started running, he said it sounded like a lion and an elephant at the same time as it was running through that thicket. He said, and it screamed probably as long as he could hear it breaking branches. I don't know how many yards that would be, but but it's quite a distance before you stop hearing something in the woods anyhow. When, when you're in a forest, things tend to amplify in sound. And so I'm assuming he was probably a couple hundred yards away before my father even reacted to get out of the tree stand. And he, he said that sound was it was absolutely frightening to the bone. Now, the the tree stand he was in, he had just bought the previous season, and tree climbers at the time were quite expensive. And for him to have left it, not to ever retrieve it, it was surprising to me. He didn't tell me this story until just a couple months before he died. I recall the day because... He told me, he said, we're never hunting there again. We, we will never hunt there again. And I asked him, why not? And he said, son, we're just not hunting there anymore. And I left it at that. And I really put no, no thought into it until he told me the story just prior to his death. After he told me this story, I took the time to look around. Because like I said, I've never heard of anything humanoid being sighted on the eastern shore. But... As I told you previously, that particular swamp was widely discussed as being haunted, but no one ever said haunted by who or what. And after hearing this story, I have no doubt that is what people probably hear or see in that area. And that's why it was quote unquote haunted. How far back did those uh, accounts that you found through your research go back, roughly? Uh, at, at least several decades. Now, I know I didn't research any further than that, but when he told me this story, when I started doing research, I know there were other accounts pretty much starting from the, the northern part of Delaware, which is on the peninsula with the Delaware, Maryland, and then Virginia. A lot of people aren't going to even know what the eastern shore is or even where it's at. But it's a peninsula that, that hangs off the east coast there. When you think of D.C. or Baltimore, you got the bay, and then you have the eastern shore, which is Delaware, uh, Maryland, and, and a portion of Virginia. And the, the, the few sightings that I'd come across, this uh, a cursory search on the Internet, it, there were sightings in Delaware. Maryland and Virginia the same year. You're in Florida now, but this has Correct. influenced you down there. You say you are looking for the skunk ape down in Mayaka State Park, correct? My, correct. Correct. So much that I've actually, in the last six months, moved adjacent to, to the state park. Because where I was living here in Florida, which was Bradenton, Bradenton, Sarasota area. That's west of, of this Mayaka area. And it, it would take me about an hour to get where I needed to be just before I even got out of my car. Now I'm, it takes me five minutes. It gives me time to, to re really focus on what I'm trying to do out there. Personally, I haven't experienced anything. 
I, I've come across some partial prints that are questionable, but I, I have yet to come across any full prints that I could cast or say, yeah, that's definitely not human. But after my father told me that, and he was emphatic that I continued to search because you hear stories from people that live here and have lived here for many generations. And these stories, I believe to be, are 100% accurate and true. Are you able to share any of those stories that have been passed around for generations? Or is that a thing where we can't really well, talk about? Most of what I've seen are glimpses at this thing. Not so much long periods of time to observe them, but there's been people tell me they've had one run across. The, the road really late at night on some of these back roads. And for the people who are not familiar with how remote this area is, as far as there's some of these roads back here, there, there is literally nothing but trees and swamp and more water. As far as you can see, people think of Florida as pretty well built up, but the center of the state is... It is still primordial. It really is. It's a beautiful sight. And, uh, you know, I encourage everybody to come and check out our state parks because there, there are magnificent creatures out here to be seen by all. And the skunk ape is, is an extremely rare creature. And people do see it. And there's, I have no doubt of that. What do you feel that the skunk ape is? What is it that you're looking for when you go out exactly? Personally, I feel I feel a connection with all creatures. Not it's not just the skunk ape as, aspect of it. When I'm out, I'm not just looking for skunk ape. I'm looking for other rare animals also. But I feel a connection like deep in my soul when I look for these things because it to me, it feels like maybe a, a, a cousin or some kinship to it, to humans. And you know, it's, it's hard to put in words, but I feel a, a spiritual connection there. And, uh, you know, I, I hope one day to be able to see one or at least get some really good evidence through footprints or other means. Uh, the state is restrictive about what you can and can't do in there as far as like putting cameras up and things like that. You have to get permission and they have to be put on a map and the rangers keep keep eye on things like that. It makes it a little more difficult because of that. You're out there, you're going to have to experience it yourself or witness something that is enough for you to say, wow, this is it. This is real. And I think there's certain things that some people require and others are willing to, to, to take a feeling and a need to try and find these things. Oh, I agree. Once you've started to look for the creature, whatever that is and wherever that is, it's a thing that it's pretty hard to give up once you start looking for it. You also mentioned that there were acquaintances you had that had gotten video of the skunk ape? Is Correct. that anything more Correct. you can go into? I'll say this. The guy I'm referring to, he, he his video has made the rounds on various supernatural shows and things. The funny thing is, and this amazes me a little, they always show just his video, never any of his snapshots that he managed to take. He, he, he got really close to the, this thing. And... For whatever reason, they never used the snapshot photos he had. Now, keep in mind, the video he had, there was probably two dozen people standing there witnessing this. And if you go back and look at the video, and anybody that's familiar with Big Pudding or Skunk Ape probably knows the video I'm referring to. I don't want to say his name because I haven't spoken to him about this. But if you go back and look at the video, as the video begins, just to his right, there's, there's a young lady standing there with a massive camera. Now, what I'd like to know is what happened to her snapshots. Things like that, I don't know why go unnoticed, 
or ignored. But the, I guarantee there are more photos or videos of this thing from that same event. That's very interesting because I, I w- I'm 99% that I know what video you're talking about, but it's interesting to know that extra information where there are other people there and you bring up a good point. What happened to what they captured? If they're listening and contact me at Bigfoot society at gmail.com. I'd love to hear that information or see what you had captured as well. That's very interesting. Get those videos and, get those videos and, and photographs into this guy because it's important that we document these things. If they are as rare as I believe they are, they should be put on an endangered or a rare species uh, list. So people don't go out there and deliberately shoot these things. Something so rare and beautiful should be observed, not hunted. Hernando will end with this. What will it take for you to to feel like you've reached your goal of searching for this creature down in Florida? What would be the thing that would have to happen in order for you to feel like you've reached your goal? For, for me personally, it would, it would have to be a sighting similar to my father's or the gentleman that took the video I'm referring to. His feelings on it was what he was saying was 100% real. It wasn't a bear. It was on two feet. It was human-like and it did not want to be harassed. I appreciate you reaching out, and this has been a extremely enlightening conversation. I'm sure that in the future, once you're able to find what you're looking for, I would definitely say don't be afraid to reach back out to me. I'd love to talk to you again. But are there any closing words before we wrap up this phone call? Yes. Never give up. Anybody out there that that Bigfoot, don't give up. They are out there. You could spend an entire lifetime and only see one or none, but they are out there. All right, Bigfoot Society, we've got the privilege of talking to a new friend, Keith, calling in from Vancouver Island. How's it going today, Keith? Really good. We got some half decent weather here for winter. That's been nice. Still got snow up there? Yeah, we don't, no, we don't get much in Gold River where I am uh-huh. on the west side, middle of the island. It's really a, a lot of rain, 90% rain in the winter up here. So mm. the mountains get more snow, but in the valley where we are, it's really nice and wet. I just came back from a weekend across the island on the east side. I met up with four other researchers over there, and we just spent the night, set up some sound equipment, did some hikes, and checked out some video cameras that are in the bush, and changed some cards, and it was pretty interesting, that trip. Slept in the car, froze. It was really windy and cold over where we were on the East Coast, and... Yeah, things have been going good. The Sasquatch is on Vancouver Island. You've been looking into Sasquatch for a long time out there. How did you get started with that, Keith? Ooh, the Gimlin film first off, and then living out here and moving from Manitoba to Vancouver Island and living with the native community, basically. My parents bought a taxi company in the northwest middle of Vancouver Island in the village of Gold River. And we ran that for 13 years. Just talking to the natives that we traveled with back and forth, just their old stories about Sasquatches trying to get in the villages back in the 1800s, the Sasquatch would reach in. The kids would sleep in the middle of the floor, not in the edges, because the Sasquatch would reach into the bungalows and try to grab the kids. Yeah, there's quite a history back, back to the 1800s on Vancouver Island. If you look up the story about Mushlet Harry, an old native trapper back from the Mauka band, 
which is up in Gold River here. That's the oldest account that I know of, and that dates back to the 1800s of Sasquatch being on Vancouver Island, and which is really cool because from the mainland on the east side, you can see it from the island. So it's a two-mile swim. So Sasquatch is actually commute from Alert Bay over to the islands and the island hop. They come to Alert Bay and they do a lot of howling up at the native reserve up there. I've got friends up there that send me uh, phone um, recordings of howls, grunts, sounds. That's pretty cool. For Sasquatch from Vancouver Island, there's a lot of activity. We just missed out on a bunch of howls and whoops Saturday night. We went up by Wasp area, Port Alberni Wasp and the Pormigino Wasp, sorry. And we were up there on the east side and some of the four researchers that we met up there got some really good howls and barks and tree knocks and we just set up a sound recorder in the bush up on the ridge below where they were camping. And they said we caught some good info. Uh, it's interesting. The Sasquatch really flourish here. It's such a cool habitat. We got Sasquatches that live basically on the ocean, eating clams, seals, anything on the ocean. It's so abundant. And then we got ones that chase elk in the forest. I really believe that some of the Sasquatches heard them up into a valley in the wintertime, and we'll feed off of them during the winters. Oh, here, such a good food for Sasquatches. Ooh, it's a beautiful habitat. Vancouver Island's about a thousand miles long and maybe 75 miles wide at the widest points. And the west side of it is open ocean to China. It's just rugged oceans, lots of beautiful big beaches on the west side, but you either fly in a helicopter, seaplane, or boat. And that's the only accessible way in the west coast. A few villages out there, Alert Bay, and they're really nice. Alert Bay is a Sasquatch haven. The Sasquatch just swim over from the mainland over there for some reason, and they spend a lot of time on the beaches. Fishing clamshells and other bays, real hot spots for them. It's just annoying, they tell us. There's so many, it gets dogs barking up at the res. <laughs> yeah, we got hot spots on the island where they do come to shore, and we don't know why yet, but they come from the mainland over the island, and then they'll go back and different seasons, and we lose them. We go from the area, and then they'll be gone. I got about four areas out here that I really spend time in in the last 40 years, and there's activity up there. But we go out for a week, spend a week in the bush. They will come into camp, throw rocks. My girlfriend's sister was a major non-believer until two summers ago where she has a baseball-sized boulder was thrown at a tree five feet away from her at a campsite, 10 minutes out of Gold River. So we don't have to travel that far to get Sasquatches. We've had them in town sightings. We've had one at the water tower, one at the reserve out here, and within two miles of town, the reserve, the water towers half a mile up the road, a uh, gentleman walked his dog up by the water tower, and the Sasquatch walked right in front of him, and the guy didn't believe in him. Until then, he just was a normal believer. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> in town, that's really nice for Gold River, but we are settled in the bush. We do have bears, a lot of black bears in Gold River, in the island, Cougars, wolves, and there's probably about 40 grizzly bears up at the north end of the island now. Elk, deer, yeah, we got quite a variety of animals, lots of food. 
There's no shortage of Sasquatch food on the island. If you're on the West Coast, it's not hard for them to be on all fours, run out, grab a seal. There's a meal for them. So it's, it's really cool. I got a good friend of mine that's putting a boating outing together. They're going to go cruise some beaches, hit an old army base that's deserted, spend the night there doing a little bit of research, set some sound equipment up, a few trail cams, and see if they can get Sasquatch on the beach eating clamshells. So that's their goal. You mentioned you have grizzly bears around the, the area, and I've talked to a gentleman in Montana, and he said there's times when the Sasquatch will almost fight uh, the grizzlies. They found grizzlies that have their necks broken. Have you ever heard any experiences where the Sasquatch are going up against the larger predators in the area of the but river or anything? The grizzlies, I don't know about, but okay. the bears won't. The bears will not. They won't mess with them. The black bears? Yeah, mm -hmm. the black bears, yeah, they won't mess with them. Like, you imagine a, a baseball-sized rock being thrown at an elk leg mm. to uh, slow it down in the bush. And they'll grab that elk and break his neck like nothing. Wow. But uh, their hunting skills are, they do use weapons. A rock's a weapon. And they'll bring down an elk to his leg and slow it down, you know, maim it. Follow it, maim it, take it down. I've come across about three elk in the past 15 years, unexplained dead, just in the bush laying there, beautiful elk within, you know, he's been dead for maybe half an hour. No bullet wound, it's not hunting season. Good luck to anybody up there even. There's such a vast wilderness out here. Lots of logging roads, there's lots of access. 90% of Vancouver Island's logged. Well, that's the sad part. Yeah, accessibility is really nice. We, we do have a lot of old timber still in, in a lot of the parts of the island. First growth timber and the second growth is really nice. Nipkish Valley has really grown over beautifully in the last 20 years. We got caves running up and down Nimkish Valley. Just about every mountain will have a cave unit somewhere in it. Some loggers I know found a giant cave up. You got to get a boat, take a boat up the inlet, and there's a big cave up there. One guy went in 300 feet by himself, and he said he can stand up the hole all the way. But he came back after about 300 feet of, but he said it goes in, way in. So we're going to go out there this summer, set up a few trail cameras, sound equipment over by that area and, and then camp for about eight days and see what happens over in that area. But what I've learned over the years is four days in the bush out here, a Sasquatch will come to camp. It's, they're really curious. They know about us. They've watched Vancouver Island grow. Well, we got residential Sasquatches, and then we got island hoppers. It's, how do you describe it? You're in awe. A friend and I were up in a mountain lake, 22 kilometers out of town here. Somebody had made a homemade picnic table out of an old piece of wood. And there was a giant picnic table there. And where we camped, from the picnic table, must have been about 80 yards away from the table towards the lake. And there's a little trail that walks towards the lake, and then you come across the picnic table, make a left, and go down three steps, and you're on the lake. And so just a giant picnic table, somebody made out of some old wood that was falling over in the wind blow. We're out there one night, 10 o'clock at night, day four, day five. We're out there 10 o'clock at night, and we hear this knock on the picnic table. Three raps, bang. Your heart right away. You can't control that. And then the adrenaline starts to flow. And my buddy and I, we looked at each other, and neither of us moved. We didn't know what to do. It was like, it was so clear, so loud. And it's like, boom, on that picnic table. 
80 feet away, 10 o'clock at night, it is pitch black. The only thing we got going is the fire. No lanterns, no flashlights handy to grab and run to the picnic table, but we did not investigate it. Him and I just sat there, and we never heard a thing after that. But we never heard it come in the camp. It was so quiet. I think I walked along the lake edge and snuck into the camp up to the picnic table and then wrapped the three wraps up there. But that was exciting. <laughs> Another time the same man, same guy I was out with, we spent 10 days up in the river and I, we chased one up a mountain and we got nine whoops. We didn't catch it, but we tried tracking it the best we could <laughs> up this mountain and we came to a rock impassable for us. There's no way we can get up that rock. Once you go to the timbers, it turned into a rock face. And you can see where it climbed up to the moss, was ripped off the rock in certain areas. That's like a chimpanzee climbing up there, but an 1800 pound one. All fours. There was nothing for it to get up there. So we turned around, came back down to camp. I had my video camera going, and I was telling people that we were up this ridge up this mountain, trying to chase a Sasquatch up there that we saw earlier or heard earlier. So uh, I got nine whoops as I'm videotaping. You can hear them, but I, I made the mistake and walked towards the river. Okay. And the river drowned the sound uh. and laughed four whoops out. Mm. So you, you got more river than whoops. So, yeah, I got nine whoops on my video camera anyways. That was pretty cool. And odor. I have never, ever, ever I smelled a Sasquatch in the bush. You know how they talk about that putent, sure. rotten meat smell? I've never had that. I've never come across a dead deer or something in the bush. And I've never smelled a Sasquatch here yet. And Tree structures. I've never come anything like giant trees being hoisted up in the air and stacked together. That's something else I've never come across here. On the mainland, they, I've heard stories. A uh, four-foot round tree will be wedged up against another one, and then four or five other smaller, longer poles will be jammed up against him. Make some kind of teepee effect. Out here, I've never found those. And it's really hard. They make beds. They don't make houses. They're laying a nest like a gorilla out here on the island. They don't make houses. You won't find any tree structures where you climb into it and branches like a little fort. That they, they won't do it out here. Have you found nest sites then? It's hard to say because of the ground out here is like you get sure. a bunch of ferns. And you don't know if the elk are laying in them mm. or Sasquatch. So that's the thing. The elk will lay in the ferns, too, and the Sasquatch. And you, but you find indents where you think they were sitting over the years. One tree will be all. The bark might just picked off parts of the tree, and you might find an indent where he'll sit. And just sit there and... Yeah, then they're very sneaky. I did catch a picture about two weeks ago of one following us. I could hear it in the background. So I turned around, took a picture, and we just kept walking. I got home, I posted that picture, and a lady on my group site says, Oh, you caught a Sasquatch in the background by those three alder trees. And so she zoomed it in and reposted those pictures. And sure enough, to the face of a young juvenile, young Sasquatch. It's not an old one, it's a young black one. So we did check the face of a Sasquatch going up the logging road. So I went and set a trail camera up there. The elk were up there a while ago. There's lots of fresh cat, a few deer. So I said, oh, we'll see if the elk or the trail camera up. Maybe we'll catch an elk or the deer, maybe even a Sasquatch. So I've got a trail camera in the area where 
a picture of a Sasquatch. So that was pretty interesting. It was like, what would be our cost? Something was following us. But you don't hear a lot. Our bush is really quiet. We heard maybe four birds today when we were out for three hours hiking around to the head one of the lakes. Me and two buddies. The bush is really quiet. And we're talking about deer and elk while we're hiking. Like just you don't see them. We make so much noise in the forest, even walking these big trails that are up behind one of our lakes. It's a group community lake. Lots of trails back there for the people to walk. A little safer. I was up there today just hiking around, and we're talking about just like they run a deer. Our valleys echo. If you start off the highway and start driving down the valley, that car will echo four miles down the valley. Everything hears you coming. Sasquatch is here. So I found the best way to find a Sasquatch is let him come to you. And that's why we spend uh, days at the campsite. The long sled camping with activity is 20 days. Me and a guy. I brought a guy in from Hope. And uh, him and I spent 20 days in the bush. And that was really interesting. But we had no equipment. I don't work. I'm retired. Health reasons. But I, I don't. So I don't have any equipment. I don't have sound equipment. I wouldn't have big mics with a dish. That'd be really cool to have. And the night vision. Oh, wow. There we go. I've, I've had a friend of mine that had 3,000 goggles. $3,000 goggles for night vision. Boy, it's like looking at daytime. Those are beautiful night vision goggles. But it's three grand. I don't have that kind of money. But there are guys who got money. I'm not one of them. I go out there, boots the bush, with what I got on, and be giver. Yeah, such a beautiful lot. But you spend time anywhere in this forest, a week, and they will come. Going back to how you mentioned that you grew up around the Indian culture, do you do you happen mm-hmm. to remember any other uh, stories of, of Sasquatch that you would have heard growing up that you can share? I just remember the kids, the, the older guys would say they would not sleep on the walls. They would sleep in the middle of the floor. Four or five kids mm-hmm. Sasquatch are trying to get through the... But uh, when Morris McLean, is an old native guy, he passed away many years ago. He was a really good friend of mine. When he was five years old, they used to boat, they'd kayak from Friendly Cove, Nutch Island, up the inlet to Old River. And they would hike two days in the Campbell River, which is on the east side. It's an hour out of Gold River if you drive. Now, but they would hike it. It would take them two days along the river trails. But Morris would cry because he would be so scared because they'd be camping in Sasquatch areas. And the Sasquatches knew it. And they would leave gifts, bread, and they would leave fish for them when they would leave camp to the Sasquatches. And it's not bugging them. This is what it was. Don't come into camp and steal our food. But Morris would cry every time they'd spend the night in the forest hiking on the way in the Camp River. They've been back here since my 1900s, 1800s, as much of the Harry story. Yeah, there's not many occurrences happen lately. I don't know what to say anymore. I'm going to run here. Keith, I appreciate you chatting. Uh, I've, got, I've got a curveball yeah. question for you. The thing I love about Canada is that up there, there's plenty of these stories about dinosaurs and things seen, prehistoric creatures. You've got the Partridge Creek monster. You've got uh, the Nahani Valley, where supposedly there's a undiscovered valley of prehistoric creatures. If you hear stuff like that, does that jog your mind to any stories at all that you've heard over the years? And if not, don't worry about it. No, not for prehistoric creatures, but I've been in some forests where you'd expect 
to see some kind of plant-eating creature, you just expect this. This is this is dinosaur forest. <laughs> I've been to a few of them, but no, no dinosaurs are. <laughs> We did get one years ago. Somebody did find a big skeleton on one of the rivers down island. Oh, really? So there was a real, yeah, some kind of fish creature. Like the Loch Ness Monster, long neck, big mm. fins, big hump body. Looked like Dino from Fred Flintstone with, oh, sure. with fin. Yeah. So some creature like that was found on one of the rivers on the island. You know, 120 feet long. But that skeleton is on the island somewhere. That's the only way I know of over here. But yeah, our bush is thick in areas that, and so full of cool plants. Keith, one one last question before I let you go. Has there ever been okay. a time that you can think of over the years of researching in the bush, being out there for days at a time, where it was so weird something was so off that you're like, I'd rather not be here right now. I just, you just got the chills. Anything like that. I broke down. I was trying to head to McCurry Creek, which is up the inlet from gold river, but there's a logging road that takes you right to the ocean. And it's only about three miles up from our government wharf. But you got to drive the logging road all the way around, which takes about three hours to get to the exact same place. I broke down the cross ditch. I hit it too hard, bust my Jeep, set up a tent. My buddy went and crashed in there. I spent the night on a fire, sitting by a fire. All night behind me, I could hear something throwing rocks and pebbles. Not big ones, just little. You hear it on hit the logging road. But then you hear snap. It would sit there and break a branch, a twig. Not a big twig, but just uh, some like a side of a toothpick. And you hear it. And I turned around. I couldn't see anything. This holy cow. That freaked me out. That was a weird night. But all night until dusk. When I could see the silhouettes of the trees and the mountains, it got quiet. It left, whatever it was. But it stayed there for about five hours dropping rocks on the road and just breaking the branches, but it never moved. It stayed in that one place behind me. And I never got the nerve to stand up. I didn't have a flashlight because I didn't have one. And I wasn't expecting to break down at 12 o'clock at night. Yeah, that's the only freaky thing I ever had where I knew I shouldn't have been here. Like, I'm on my own, buddy sleeping in <laughs> And yeah, I'm sitting out here, and, it's, and that was the only thing that got me was all night it would break a little branch, and I turn my head, but I couldn't see it. And I'm sure you could see my silhouette, and it was just sitting there laughing at me. Oh and man, yeah, for about five hours, it just teased me. That's funny, but after a while, it started to freak me out because it wouldn't stop, huh? Yeah, and that was the thing. And I would turn around, I couldn't see any, it was just black pitch black in that forest on that logging road. Wow. Yeah, that's Very a, cool. That that's a cool story, Keith. I shouldn't be here. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate you chatting with me tonight. Uh, keep me in mind if anything else weird happens in the future, hit me up on Facebook. Let me know. Maybe we can get a new chat with you in the future. Thanks so much for talking tonight, Keith. Okay. Thank you guys. Just want to take a few minutes to say thank you to you, all my listeners, for listening to the podcast. Please take a minute to help out the show by subscribing on YouTube, making sure you hit the bell so you don't miss any notifications, and share the episode on YouTube with a friend. Also, if you're listening to us on a podcast, thank you so much. Make sure that you're subscribed, share the show with a friend. Really, it's all about sharing the show wherever you can. If you've had a Bigfoot encounter related to the following or know someone who has, please reach out to me at BigfootSociety at gmail.com or pass on my email. Here's a list. All right, I'm going to use this space uh, this week to announce that I'll be at the Sasquatch Summerfest in Oak Ridge, Oregon as an attender. I won't be presenting or anything, but I'll be hanging out trying to interview people that have had Bigfoot encounters. 
If you're from the Oak Ridge, Oregon area or surrounding and you've had a Bigfoot experience, please contact me directly, BigfootSociety at gmail.com. Also, Priscilla was nice enough that if you get your tickets through SasquatchSummerFest.com and use code BigfootSociety, you can get 50% off the cost of your tickets, which is a big amount. So uh, code BigfootSociety to get 50% off your tickets, SasquatchSummerFest.com, and uh, helps out the podcast as well. A special thank you to all the Bigfoot Society Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's your support that helps keep the show going, and I extremely appreciate it.